So today we're talking, we're continuing on reinforcement learning. We're going to have basically four lectures on reinforcement learning. Much of this is based on uh, this book, Reinforcement Learning, second edition, which came out like a week ago or something like that. Uh, it's available online as a final draft. So um, for reinforcement learning, this is what I recommend. And this is a, just a suggested reading also in the schedule. The free version online is also tons cheaper than this, of course. Uh, and the first edition, any guesses when that would have been written? 98, 20 years ago. So reinforcement learning was not quite as hot a topic uh, as it is now. And the interesting thing is most of the big work on reinforcement learning is done, any guesses where? What university? What country is big in uh, machine learning? China. No, no, I mean China, sort of, yes, but actually a lot from Canada. University of Toronto, Jeff Hinton, uh, Montreal, uh, Khan, and Bengio, and University of Alber Alberta does reinforcement learning. They have like a 20-person team that does that. And they, in fact, have gotten a lot of good results in poker. Um, they have very good poker players. So we're going to talk today about reinforcement learning more, about what a policy is, what a action value and state value functions are. And then on Wednesday, we'll talk about Bellman equations. So these are sort of the fundamental uh, recursive equations that define uh, value in state. And then some Monte Carlo methods for de determining the learning. Because as you'll see, the real key is coming up with a policy. And a way to get a policy is figure out action value functions. Okay? So Monte Carlo methods is one way to do that. Temporal difference learning is another. And then we're going to look at applications of that to alpha zero, which is basically the Go and chess playing uh, programs of DeepMind. And this is where we're going to pull in neural networks. So before this in reinforcement learning, uh, we won't be using any form of neural networks, but there we will. All right? So uh, this is an interesting diagram by David Silver. He's one of the founders of DeepMind um, and also at Cambridge. Uh, and so kind of showing where reinforce, reinforcement learning fits at the intersection of computer science, engineering, math, econ, psychology, and neuroscience. And where it kind of shows for every set of overlaps here what it is we're sort of talking about. You know, mathematics, the intersection of mathematics, engineering, and economics is operations research. Or engineering, computer science, neuroscience is machine learning. So anyway, reinforcement learning kind of fits in there. Uh, we talked about the fact that in some ways you use reinforcement learning when you're doing drug training and things like that. Right? That's really classical and operant conditioning. So here's the reinforcement learning interface. We've got an environment, which is the world in some way. This may be the real world. It may be a simulated world. But as far as the agent is concerned, it's everything outside of the agent. The environment provides some sort of a state or stimulus or situation. But the state is kind of how things currently are. The agent then takes some sort of an action. Okay. When the agent takes an action, the environment produces a reward, possibly empty, right? possibly zero, and also takes us to a new state. And so this information of taking an action, getting back a reward, and getting back a new state is the reinforcement learning sort of interface. So give me an example of what an agent could be. OK, a person. Sure. So you're a person, I don't know, driving, let's say. OK. What controls might you have? Gas brakes, steering wheel. So that's, that's one possibility as the interface that you choose is the gas brakes and steering wheel. Uh, and so you can decide how much to turn the steering wheel and whether to press the gas or the brakes or if you improperly use two feet, both. 
right? What state might you get back? Speed, direction, you go. I mean, if you think of it, you're limited to what you can get via your senses, right? So you could go very low level and say, well, it's going to be whatever the um, waveforms are of any audio uh, and, you know, any just a picture of the visual, which might include a speedometer so you could see the speed, or it might be higher level information like you get on a, well, a good example would be on an airplane with a, you know, heads up display where. Uh, you've got all sorts of information integrated, and you're told specifically ignore what you see because you know it might be wrong. The control and the reward. And I don't know if if the goal is not to die, then maybe what you're getting is a, a positive reward on all time steps until you die, right? Um, or alternatively, you can imagine nothing and then a big negative when you die. And even discounted, that's still going to be worse than just getting zero forever. The controls here could be how much to turn the steering wheel, right? How hard to hit the brakes, how hard to hit the accelerator. An alternate might be closer in. Maybe it's muscle movements, right, are actually the controls you're making. If you imagine a robot with arms, right, that can move, you can imagine that the arms are the control that it's doing, or you can imagine it's the servos that are controlling the arms. And it might be that there's slippage between the servo and the actual arm, and so that might be better reflected as the arm is part of the environment and you're doing servos. servos. And sometimes when you try and make some change to the servo, the state that comes out is uh, stochastic. So 95% of the time it does what you want, 5% of the time it has slight, slight errors. So we get to define really what this interface, what, where our agent ends and the environment begins. Okay. All right, so we've got this reward some sort of feedback that just says, how good are you doing? But we're trying to maximize long-term reward and not just short-term reward. That's something we as humans and even dogs learn to do pretty well. Right? We have sequentially, so they happen in order, and delayed consequences. That's an issue. Right? It's hard to learn when consequences occur far away. That's true of dog training, that's true of child training, and that's true in general of us. It's kind of hard to uh, save a lot of money in your 401k now when you guys have 45 years before you're gonna retire, right? I certainly remember my first job when I was 20 or something and they offered a 401k or whatever equivalent. They offered some retirement plan and I thought, well, I'm 20, this doesn't apply to me, right? I just ignore that. If only I'd known better. So we have delayed consequences. We have a need for trial and error. If we always, so if you go to a restaurant and you order something off the menu and you like it, one possible policy would be whenever I go back, I will order the same thing. There's some good parts about that. You know you're going to get what you like, right? Assuming there's, uh, no randomness in what you actually get back, you know, depending on what cook is there or something. But if you always order one thing and you get that, um, you get a known good positive reward. What are you missing out on? Or what might you be missing out on? Yeah, there might be, there might be something you like even more, right? So it might be worth trying some other things on the menu. That's exploring other options as well as exploiting right, this, this, this trade-off between exploiting what you found so far that's good versus exploring other things you might like. Okay, that might give you even more reward. 
Non-stationarity just says well, sometimes the environment changes over time. Right? It doesn't provide you the same rewards or take you to the same states that it used to. So some of the successes, um, back in 95, um, it learned to be the best backgammon player. So beating all humans, right? And in fact, teaching humans, just like AlphaGo has, some, some better ways to play than they had been. Um, placing and selecting advertisements and pages on the web. The, I remember when I was in, uh, at Google and the analytics, analytics team. So part of what they had was, you know, we have these ads that run on, um, on the web, right? And a user may be exposed to multiple of them. And eventually, let's say they click on one. As far as Google concern, is concerned, that's reward, right? Because they're getting paid. They're not getting paid before that. So the question is, which of the ones they saw prior to that should get the credit. Should it be the one they clicked on, the last one they saw, and we should get zero to anything before that? Or should we get some partial credit before? Okay. And that is kind of a reinforcement learning problem of the fact that we have this delayed gratification, the delayed reward. Uh, in Jeopardy, some of the strategic decisions that Watson made use reinforcement learning. So I think this was how, have you ever played Jeopardy, you know, the Daily Double? So, this time comes up when you get to bet any portion of the winnings you have so far. And it's going to be double or nothing. Before you see the question. It's a lot easier after you see the question. So before you see the, well, before you see the answer, um, and before you give the question. So you have to determine how much to bet. And so reinforcement was learning is learning was used as a way to figure out how much to bet in these situations. Uh, Atari games. You may have all seen this. So this is basically uh, DeepMind a couple of years ago showing how reinforcement learning along with neural networks could learn to play Atari games. So let's look at an example, just a couple of these. So TD Gammon. And again, what's most impressive is uh, that it was so long ago, right? 25 years ago. 25, yeah. So this is a backgammon board. It doesn't matter if you know how to play backgammon or not, but it was kind of a fun game. Um, and so that was expressed and fed into a neural network. Show, the weird part about this diagram is this doesn't represent this board, sorry. So don't get too confused if you're trying to exactly map those. But the idea is we would take the board and feed this as input here. And this was a fairly small neural network because of the fact that it was in the early to mid 90s. Okay. That would then come out with an estimated state value. So this is a particular state, right? You look at the state of the, they're not called stones, but let's just call them stones on the board. And this is one state, and the question is, what is the probability of winning? Let's say white winning in this state. And so if you imagine then, you can, assuming you have such a neural network, you can look and say, okay, if this is my current state, I can look at the possible actions to take. And then once I take those actions, evaluate the probability of winning at those, and then choose the best one. And I can actually take that a couple layers deep. Right? Maybe not trying all possible actions, but I have some way of knowing some actions that are possibly better than other actions. And so that, has, that allows me to figure out what might be the best move at this time, the best action. This value estimation was learned. Okay? And it was done, random network, and we start by playing against itself. So I'm gonna play backgammon against you. Sorry, I'm going to play backgammon against myself on the other side. Um, and to begin with, they play really, really, really poorly, right? But 
eventually the game ends, okay? And then one of them gets a reward, and we use that to update these values. And then we do that more and more and more. One nice thing about playing against yourself is you're pretty evenly matched, all right? So it is difficult to learn. Have you ever played, I don't know, as a beginner, let's say tennis, with a really good tennis player who doesn't um, scale back, doesn't handicap themselves, right? Basically, you're not gonna return any serves, or if you return one, you'll, you'll die soon thereafter. In fact, how many times will you practice serving? Maybe once, um, right? So it's just not a great learning environment. There's not a lot to learn. It's, and it's unlikely you're gonna randomly win one game. So nicer to have it more evenly matched, and this does that, even matching. Okay. And six weeks of training. So if we took that to today's training, this would be, what, six minutes maybe? Um, then it's the best player back in. It, you, it did originally use some expert handcrafted features. Okay. It represented the board in such a way that would make it easy for the network to learn. And they changed that and just put in raw board positions later. Well, when they wanted to get the best possible, they combined both. All right. What is going on here? Uh, the Atari games. So basically what they did is take an Atari 2600 simulator, which has a bunch of games you can play on it. All right, you can download this and use these all. Uh, and they had like 20 games, something like that. And what they would do would, was to feed in the screen images. Right? As we talked about on last Monday, a single screen image isn't enough. Right, because we lose information like velocity of, of, of moving things on the screen. And so they put in the K last uh, screens. They did a little bit of a, else too. I think that they converted it to grayscale and also shrunk it down to reduce the amount of processing needed. And then the only thing, so the state was the state of the screen. What do you think the reward was? Not quite the score, right? So if I'm here and I shoot one of these guys and the score is now 31, do I get 31 reward? Not for this time step, right? For this time step, I earned a one, right? So we need to look at the delta. And what they actually did was just looked at the delta to see what you earned this time and uh, took the sign of that, basically. So it was one, zero, or negative one. And the reason they did that was to try and have the same training be used across lots of different games that had wildly different sort of scoring mechanics. So uh, the, did this play against itself? No, I mean, Space Invaders is a one-person game, so they definitely were not playing against themselves. So we had the screen pixels coming in, and out of here, what we had is instead of one final thing, which is what's the, current, what's the value of the current state, they actually outputted what's the value of doing all of the possible actions I could do. So if I go up, what kind of what kind of value would I expect over the long term, right? Not my immediate reward, but over the long term, what will I get going up, left, down, right, diagonal, pressing the shoot button, and so on. So I guess this is moving in a direction and moving in a direction and firing at the same time. Let's say you had this all trained and you got a particular, you're at a particular part in the game. How do you know what to do? Uh, 
you're trying to maximize your total reward, right? And what you're getting out of here is, what is my projection of what my total reward will be if I do each of these things? So what's the best thing to do? Pick the best one. That's right. Okay. So once again, once you know the value, it's pretty easy to decide what to do. In the previous example we saw, there was just one value for the current state. Assuming you took sort of the optimal action, what, what would you get? And we had to kind of look ahead to see what action to do. Here we don't have to look ahead, which is nice. Looking ahead in backgammon is kind of easy because you can simulate it pretty easily. But in uh, a video game, it would be hard to simulate your different actions. Right? You would have to kind of try each of the different actions, simulate a time step using the uh, Atari simulator for each one, see what state you got. It would just be a mess. So this works better in this case. Um, same exact format here. Same inputs, same actions. It's kind of handy because there's a single input device, so we know what the possible actions are. Train differently for each game, right? So we train this once on breakout, lots and lots and lots of times. We train it in other times for, say, Space Invaders and so on. And what happened is, um, for more than half the games, it's at human level. Okay? And it's better than all the previous algorithms. Uh, I, I, so this is not quite. In all these cases, performance was better than could be obtained by any other existing method. We're not trying to claim that this is better than all possible methods. Okay. And again, no human instruction. All right, so again, we've got our reinforcement learning interface. The environment, we may not know what the environment is, right? In some cases, like backgammon, we know the environment. And in fact, we know the transitions that will occur. We know if we take this action, that this state will occur. In the case of a robot trying to move its arm, if we move our servo, we don't know exactly what state we're going to end up, right? The arm may have moved, or there may have been some glitch and it didn't move. So it's stochastic. Certainly nonlinear, quite complex. The real world turns out to be fairly complex, in fact. And what we're trying to learn is a policy that says, given you're in this state, what action should you take? That's our goal. Learn a policy. So can I have a policy that takes me from a state to an action. Is this sufficient for backgammon? Yes. OK. In fact, let me, this is deterministic policy. You can imagine a non-deterministic policy that has a state and has various actions that might come out, A1 and A2, with particular probabilities. Poorly named probabilities. So, give me an example of, let's say, a game where you would want a non deterministic policy. Poker. Okay, that's the one I was thinking of, so you win. Um, give me an example. So, if I've got pocket aces, right? So, exactly. So, if I've got two aces, which is the best possible hand I can have below, and before anything happens, if I always bet big, then they're going to be less likely to call my, my bet. If some percentage of the time I slow play those and play as if they're not very good, then I'm going to increase my overall expected return. So, if you had a deterministic poker policy, you would have a real problem. Okay. 
You can imagine also a deterministic um, uh, rock, paper, scissors, right? Where the state is maybe what we did the last time. Deterministic would be a real problem. Right? It's still hard to believe that apparently there are people who can play rock, scissors, papers and win more than a random amount. Right? So, but if they try and play against you, what's your solution? What? Random, really random. Yeah. Flip your three headed coin and do what it says. All right, so our environment. We're going to assume our environment's a finite Markov decision process, for the moment finite. Later on, we might look at infinite. We have time steps, discrete set of time steps. We have a finite set of states, a finite set of actions, a finite set of Yeah, I don't know why we need a finite set of rewards. It seems like anything in reals should be OK. So to think about that one. Um, and then we've got this trajectory. At time t, we're in state t. We take action, sub t, whatever that is, one of the finite set of actions. And then we get a return and tells us what a new state is. So what we're choosing is a. And what we get out of it is a reward and a new state. And from that, we choose an action again. And that continues on. We're going to say for now, forever, it can also terminate. So there are both terminating and non-terminating. And so we have these Markov dynamics. So Markovs were stochastic. We have some randomness in it. So given a particular state in action, there might be different states that um, come out of that randomly. So our probability of being in state S prime and having reward R after being in state S taking action A is just, that's what we have here. It's that probability, right, that we get this return and we're in this new state given these previous states. So for a given state S and action, sorry, for a given state S, Across all the actions, the sum of the probabilities, of course, needs to be one, that we're going to be going somewhere. So if I'm in state five and I take an action like move up, and I now am in state six and I got a reward of three, every time I'm in state five and do an up and go to state six, I'm going to get the same reward. Okay? So we always get the same reward going. We could define it either way, actually. So we could either say if we want to have different rewards, there are actually different states. Or we can collapse them into one state and say we, have, we can have possibly different rewards. All right, so we're going to do a game. You guys are the reinforcement learner. I am the environment. And I have a set, I have two things of interest here. So I have kind of my rules, and I have a table of random numbers. <laughs> so there is some randomness in this. So you're in state A. There are three states, state A, state B, and state T, where T is terminal. So the game's over once you get to the T state. And your goal is to try and, let's say, undiscounted, so just the total amount of reward undiscounted. Okay. So. Do you want to take action one or action two? One. One? one. Are you sure? Because two might be better. OK. So we'll take action one. And I tell you, let's see. I, need to, I don't want to reuse a random number, or heaven forbid, that would be awful. So. You chose one. All right, you're in state A, and you can have a reward of plus 10. Now, clearly, you have a winning strategy, right? 
Well, or maybe. What would you like to do now? You, you don't get to choose to keep playing. We are playing. Just what do you want to do? You want to do one? Yeah. All right. I'm going to do one and you get plus 10. You can take action one or action two. Oh, oh, I thought you said stay, like move or stay. So we are still in, or you guys are in action A, or in state A. Action two. All right, let me look. Action two. You are in state B, and you get a reward of minus 10. <laughs> what would you like to do now? Sorry? Two. Two was, two was first. So we'll say two. And you are in state A. And your reward is plus 20. You want to do one? All right. One. And you get a reward of plus 10. And guess what state you're in? A. You want to do two again? All right. Two. And you're in state B. And you get a minus 10. What do you mean one? Oh, from here. OK. I thought you were trying to correct me. So one, and you're in state B. You are still in state B. And you get plus 20. One. You are in state A, and you get plus 20. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you like one? It is unfortunately too late, because you're in the terminal state, and you get a zero. So you got a total of 20, 10, 40, 50, 40, 60, 80. All right. Would you like to play again? All right. Perhaps you will be better. It is the same game. Different random numbers, though. Yeah. So, all right. Does, it, does, does what you got out of this make sense? That's what an agent would get. Just like to begin with, kind of randomly choosing actions and getting maximum rewards. Okay. Pardon me? How do they come into play? So let me go back and I'll show you. Notice that in this case, we took action one and we ended up in state B. But in this case, we took action one from state B and we ended up in state A. So there was some uh, randomness there. And really, any time we're taking an action given a state, um, there's potential randomness in what new state we go to. All right. We start out in state A. You say two. And we're in state B. 
with a minus 10. I can see why you're going this way. This is nice. One. So one gives you a plus 20 and takes you to state A. So that was two time steps for 10 reward. You could have had 10 reward possibly in one time step, but I'm not judging. One. You get minus 10. Wait, 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 wait. Take it back. You get plus 10, and you're in state A. First come, first serve. One. Terminal. So we got a total of 20 here. And I don't know if it's useful to compare these. <laughs> what, um, let's look at this, can we see that? So what, what can you learn from here? Action, so this is what we know, right? Action one in state A has a chance of, so far we know two things, it could be. There may be others, right? One possibility is? Plus 10, stay in the same state. Other possibility? Termination. And which seems to happen more often than the other? Yeah, the plus 10. All right, so you know that. All right, let's try, it so happens we have another slide. One more time. Two? Does everyone want to do two? Two. Two. We get minus 10, and we're in state A. Surprising? Two again. We have minus 10 and run state B. So the new state and reward depends on the previous state and action. But there's no history beyond that, right? which is the Markov part of it. So we're in state B. We don't care how we got here. What's going to happen does depend on state B and whatever action we take. Ooh, ooh, there's some. So one or two? All right, well, I heard one. I'll do one. I think I heard it first. So one is plus 40. And we're in state A. Two. 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 Game ends. Wait, no, the two. My mistake. Uh, we're in state A, and you get plus 10. No, you're in state A. It's hard to read this sometimes. Yeah, you get minus. It looks like it should be raced, doesn't it? All right. It prefers crossing out. Minus 10, and we're in state A. Two. Minus 10, state B. Two. Uh, plus 20, state A. <laughs> 
2. Uh, minus 10 state A. Did, did I hear one? No? No one likes one? Minus 10 in state B. One. One. Plus 40 in state A. Minus 10 in state B. Plus 40 in state A. <laughs> Minus 10 in state B. Plus 40 in state A. We're only doing as far as 18 here. So I'm not going to keep going until we terminate. Minus 10 in state B. Two plus twenty in state B. One or two? Plus twenty in state B. plus 20 and state B. So we're total, because we're done here, we ran out of time, minus 20, 20, 0, 20, 0, 40, 30, 70, 60, 100, 90, 110, 130, 150. You're getting better. So that's a good thing. And in fact, what do you think the optimal strategy is from state A? And from state B, it's actually going to be 1. If you do a 1, you always get a plus 40. If you do a 2, you always get a plus 20. They actually take the same routes. Three times in a row, we rolled a 9 or a 10 and went back to state B. So. So you'd have to play this multiple times and come up with some. OK, so, that, that, so that's kind of what reinforcement learning is like. Now we're going to have to learn how is it we can learn from these rewards what to do. Okay. And it's really handy. Wait, you don't have this page. And that's because I wanted I'd be sure you didn't know what the model is when you're playing. Okay. So our model of the world was, in state A on a 2, we have an 80% chance of going to B and, and a 20% chance of going to A. And in both cases, we get negative 10. If we do a 1, we have a 10% chance of going to our terminal state and 90% chance of getting a plus 10. And then from B, if we do a 1, we have, and actually let me make clear here. So B on a 1 goes to here and then splits out with probability 80% to A and 20% to B, and the reward is the plus. Right? So the first number here on each arc is the reward. The second number is the probability. And so you can see a 2 and a 1 are the same except for the reward. So these are the winning uh, Uh, minus 10, 20% here. That's supposed to belong to this arc here. Yeah, it's attached not very well to, to the one up above. And now that I look at it, what's this random arc? <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. So what, if we follow the optimal policy, what reward can we expect? If we have no discount factor, an infinite. 
right? Because we know how to avoid terminating. And we also know that sort of any of our cycles are positive. So we don't end up ever negative. Yeah. The problem is deterministic. So would it mean to be non deterministic and the probabilities of taking the paths keep changing? So the non deterministic is. So this is non-deterministic. Right. The environment is non-deterministic. Right. We can have a non-deterministic policy as well. Right. So the policy would say in state A, 10% of the time try action one, 90% of the time try action two. That's a non-deterministic policy. Right. So, you know, 10% of the time bluff, 90% of the time bid your true hand. I, I can see why a non-deterministic policy would make sense. Like an adversarial game where you don't want an opponent to figure out what you're doing. Does it ever make sense in like a single person game where there's like if there's no adversarial response, I believe that a deterministic, so an optimal, there's always an optimal deterministic policy. There can be optimal non-deterministic policies as well, assuming, you know, it doesn't matter whether you take action one or action two, then you could have a non-deterministic policy. So if you had a way to go from B to the terminal state, is that what you're saying? Yeah. I, I don't think you'd find that that's the case. So because if it's randomly going to take you somewhere, you know, there's not a lot you can do about that. Exactly. The higher expected. Yeah. Basically, yeah, you're going to look at your expected payoff. All right, so a reminder, we're looking at this. The Markov part of the process says, that a Markov process says we have this randomness, and that randomness depends only on the current state. So we don't need anything that happens in the past. Doesn't matter how we got to state A, from state A, we've got certain probabilities given particular actions of going to different states and getting different rewards. Now, this Markov de decision process, it may change over time, right? It may be that the probabilities change over time, um, but they're still not dependent on the state. So a policy, a deterministic policy, and our policies always are, start with a pi, pi like p for policy, okay? So a deterministic policy says the prob the Action to take, given a particular state, is this. Right? So it maps states to actions. What would a non-deterministic policy look like? Goes to, let's just look at it this way. probability of taking action S, action A in state S. Yeah. Okay. By the way, I was wondering, I was talking about this with my son. So for poker, or I guess if you're playing um, rock, paper, scissors, what do you use for your random Input. Like, let's say you have a policy that says 25% of the time in this situation, I should bluff. Where do you come up with your 25%? Do you just think, well, if I look over the last so many times, I've done this many, you know, bluffs and this many non-bluffs in this situation. What could you use? No, 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 no. I'm not saying how do you choose the percentage. Oh. I'm saying how do you choose the random number, right? I have 20. Okay, so do you ever see people at a poker table rolling <laughs> dice? 
No, they're playing craps, right? So, but it's reasonable. And what would happen, do you think? What would your opponents do if they see you flip a coin or roll a die and then make a, make a choice? It'd, it'd be interesting, right? You could do other things, like if you need a one out of four, just look at the clock and see where it is on the, you know, on there. The problem, of course, if anyone finds out your algorithm, um, then you're in deep trouble. So, but I just thought that was curious. And uh, maybe someone here will be the first to take dice to the poker table. All right, the number of deterministic policies is exponential in the number of states. Why? How many, right, if we've got A is the cardinality of the actions, and S is the cardinality of the states, how many different policies are there? S to the A? Is that what you're saying? Is the number of policies, right? Because we got we to map each S to each A. So we've got those number of possibilities. So we probably don't want to just be linearly searching through all the policies to try and find the best one. So we're trying to choose A sub T, right? This is at a particular point in time, right? We're in the midst of an episode, and we're at state S sub T. We use the policy to determine now what action we're going to take. Once we choose A sub T, what's going to happen then? So we're in a state, we choose an action. What happens? What did I do for you? You get a reward. You get a reward. So R of T plus 1 and S of T plus 1. And then you do it again, unless S of T plus 1 is a terminating state. And so what we're trying to maximize at any given point in time, doesn't matter what the reward we've got so far, right? That's a sunk cost. All we want to do is choose an action that will maximize this value. Our, our next reward and our future rewards discounted by gamma. Can we, can we build revised S today again? The number of Let's look. So I have so if I want to create a policy for the first action, sorry, for the first state. I like that better. OK. So uh, how we can think of it is we're coming up with, we have the number of states. And for each one, we have an action. Action, action, action. So we have eight choices for each one, a to the s. <coughs> Thanks for taking me down that garden path there. So, okay. Are you happier with that? Yeah. OK, good. So gam is our discount rate. In the game we just played, gamma was 1, which meant that we could end up with uh, an infinite return. And our goal is we're searching for, for a policy, some policy pi. Ideally, some optimal policy pi star, where optimal just means no other policy can beat it. All right, so we have value functions. In this case, we're going to look at an action value function. The action value function says, how good is it to be in a given state, take an action, and from then on, follow a particular policy? So Q sub pi says Q, which is the action value, given this policy, right? because it's definitely going to be dependent on the policy. Right? We're going to get different rewards in our case if from A we chose 1 as opposed to choosing 2. So we're going to, this is going to be the expectation of the rewards in order, discounted, from now on. Given we're starting in this state, 
our next action is going to be this action. So we're starting this state, we're taking this action. Does this action necessarily belong to this policy? No. We're going to start following the policy after this action. So it's take the action that is the parameter here, and from then on, all the following actions are going to be according to our policy. Does that make sense? Right? You can imagine that the value in state A of taking action 2, and again, this is the long-term value, right, is going to be dependent on what's the rest of your policy, right? Maybe your policy is take action one. It's the non-optimal policy. Take action one from here and take action two from here, okay? So that's kind of the worst you can do, I think. And so our value is gonna be different for that policy than it is for an optimal policy or some other policy. All right, so the Q function says, just to reiterate, we have a value for a state and an action. In fact, this is the function that the DeepMind example playing Atari was coming out with, right? If we look at here, nope, that's gammon, here, We're feeding in, what does this represent? This up arrow represents Q of pi of that is our state and our action is, it's really small, it looks like it's an up arrow. And this one is q pi of s up and to the right. And this is q pi of s to the right. So we can now see for the future, assuming we follow our given policy, what are these values going to be? And the best thing to do is choose the highest one. Does that make sense? So we're going to be trying to learn this function. And by learning this function, we get a policy out of it. Okay, sorry. We learn this function for a given policy, and then we're going to use that to improve our policy, and then we're going to go back and reevaluate and figure out what's this Q for this new policy, and then use that to come up with a new policy. So it's this continual policy improvement. So we're going to determine Q prime and then use that to choose, sorry, I said Q prime, Q pi, to choose pi prime, which is better than pi. And then determine Q pi prime, and then continue on and on. And determine is overstating it, really. So we're not going to determine the exact value here. We're going to just get better at it. So does uh, Q pi correspond to this equation, the action value function, the state of action, the output that we get? Yeah, so the, the Q pi. is here, right? Yeah, that's this one. So that's determining, for example, that if we're in state A and action one, this is a slightly different example, right, where we don't have a terminating state, but we do have a discount factor of 0.9, that 
taking action one from state A gives us uh, 130.39. So steady state. And A2 gives us this, B1 gives us this, B2 gives us this. From this, we can read off a policy. And the, yeah? So is the policy then the set of those state action does? Like, what, what are we calling policy? Policy can be more of a meta yeah. stuff. A policy maps a state to an action. So this is a little confusing, so let me show this. So these are the values for the optimal policy. Can't get any better than this. The optimal policy says pi of A equals what? What, what is it? No, no, no. Pi is our policy. So what do we want to do if we're in state A? Two. And pi of b equals 1, okay. which we're just sort of reading off from here and here, right? So why do we have, why are the first and the fourth rows here? If we know that this policy says for a we should always do 2 and for b we should always do 1. That is exactly what it would be. If we're in state A right now, we don't follow our policy, we instead go to action one, and from then on follow our policy, this is what we'd get. And it's no better than if we take the, what our policy says to do, and it's no better because this is an optimal policy. If we had a suboptimal policy, it's certainly possible that taking another action beyond the one our policy says to do would lead us to a higher value, right? Assume we're, uh, you know, our policy is when we go to Marie Callender's, order the meatloaf, sa meatloaf sandwich, right? It's possible that's not the optimal policy. And that if I went to Marie Callender's, which is the state, that an action of order the chicken Caesar salad might give me even higher reward. And that's part of this exploration, exploitation. I noticed there was some exploration that you guys were doing in the game. Right? We, said, we haven't tried this or haven't tried it very much. Let's see what happens. Okay. There's another value function, which is the state value function. So the state value function just says, if you're in a given state, what's the value by following your policy? So this is V for value with a given policy of a particular action. And so that is the expected value, again, of the same set of rewards given we're in this state. And from now on, including this time, we follow our policy. So let me go back to the backgammon. In the backgammon case, so what we know in the deep learning case, the Atari case, is we had a neural network approximating the Q function. What function is this approximating? It's a pro yeah, it's approximating the state value function, V sub pi, for whatever its current policy is, right? So when it was first learning to play, it had a pretty crappy policy, and so these would be low. But as it got better, Right? As the network got better and changed, we'd have different value. So we're using the value function for two things, really. Right? We're using the value function to determine what value there is and also to determine what to do. Because once you know what it's worth to either be in a state or what it's worth to be in a state and take a particular action, you know what to do. 
as a reminder, we have to do a search in this case. We know our current state, but this doesn't explicitly tell us what action to take. So we need to try all the actions and see what, val what will give us the best value. If we had infinite actions, that would be hard to do. All right, optimal. So a policy pi star is optimal if it maximizes the action value function. That is, it's optimal if the max across all policies We're saying we're doing at least as good as the best. Or, yes, at least, well, as good as the best, right? There may be multiple bests, right? There may be many policies that are optimal, but we know every one of them is going to have the same value of Q, S, comma, A. Because if any one of them had a higher one, we should choose So they have the same optimal value function. And as we said, it's easy to figure out what to do. Here, do we all know argmax? OK, yeah, so it's not the maximum value. It's the maximum A, right? So we have the maximum A. Uh, so the, max, the action that maximizes Q star of S. Okay. And the optimal policy then is greedy with respect to the value function. Right? We just look at the value function, and we take the highest one, and that's what we do. And the reason we can afford to do that is because the value function takes into account all of the future. It takes into account the expectation of all future rewards, given that policy. So it's done all the hard part. We clearly don't want to be greedy with respect to immediate rewards, right? Give you an example. You guys right, have a, um, a reward that, in some cases, is probably negative being here at school, right? You have a lot of work to do. You have to stay up late. You, know, you have to come to class, all that stuff. Plus, I guess it costs money, too, doesn't it? Yeah, so there's that aspect of it as well. So where's the reward? There's, no, it's all intrinsic reward from learning. Yeah, so the reward is later, right? And we always have a one, at least one deterministic optimal policy. How do we know that? How do we know we don't need a non-deterministic optimal policy? Yeah, if you can point-wise find a state and an action right. where someone is better, then you can take that, right? Cool. All right, so we want to achieve goals. That's possible definition of intelligence. Goals we're saying we can be formulated as maximizing reward, which is expected cumulative discounted reward over time. Okay? Expect, we're using expectation because we don't know for sure what will happen. We're looking at all of the rewards, and we're discounting them by whatever discount factor makes sense. Right? Um, some people's discount factor is extremely high. You know. <coughs> Spending today is worth a lot more than saving for tomorrow. Another way to think of it is a, is a high discount factor cares less about your future self. We're looking to find pi star, which is the optimal policy. And to do that, we're going to find the optimal value function. This is the optimal action value function. And to find it, we're going to what we're going to end up doing is find the value function for a policy that's our best guess at what the current one is. And then once we find 
the queue for here, sorry, this queue that will allow us to choose in a way we haven't looked at yet a better policy. So it's all about figuring out how good a current policy is. Questions? All right, let's look at expected cumulative discounted reward over time. Um, and let's just look at expected cumulative undiscounted reward for a moment. So we got a game, okay? It's a coin flipping game. So you flip until you get a tail, okay? And you win two to the k dollars, where k is the number of heads you flipped. OK? Uh, so let's just see how this works. You flip a tail, what do you get? So you get a dollar. That's, that's not a bad game. You flip a heads and then a tail. So tails gives you a dollar. Heads tails gives you two dollars. Heads heads tails gives you four. And heads 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 tails gives you eight dollars. All right. How many of you play the lottery? You don't want to play the lottery unless the expected value is higher than your bet, right? What's the expected value of playing this game? Infinite, he throws out. So why? What's the chance of getting a dollar? One half. So the probability is one half. And the probability of winning two dollars? And the probability of winning four dollars is a date. And so if we multiply these together, we have a infinite sum of one half, which equals infinity. Would you be willing to play infinity? Would you be willing to pay I don't know, one year's tuition to play this game. But your expected value is infinite. That, so re your return on investment is quite high, right? So this is, I believe it's called the St. Petersburg Paradox. And there are a lot of different ways people sort of look at how to analyze this. Uh, you could analyze it in terms of utility. Right? That actually getting $4 billion is not all that much better than getting $4 million for many of us. Right? It's certainly not, um, doesn't linearly scale utility with money. And if you're getting whatever the numbers would be as you get more and more trillions and quadrillions and so on, that it gets to be less and less useful. There are other ways to look at it. Like, it's unlikely someone will pay you four quadrillion dollars, right? I guess also it might take a while to play. No, not that long. Exponents go up very quickly. So. Right, but if anyone would like, the problem is there is this risk of ruin. So maybe I don't want to play this. So forget it. <laughs> yeah. All right, that's it. Uh, see you guys on Wednesday.